we will briefly discuss on the definition, pathophysiology, management, and follow-up of patients with anaphylaxis. In 1900, Charles Richet and Paul Pochier were asked by Prince Albert to study the sting of jellyfish during their expeditions. During their study, they decided to give multiple sublethal doses on dogs. They expected the small dose of venom would serve as a sort of immunization to protect the dogs from future exposures. Unexpectedly, they found the opposite. The dogs that had recovered from an initial dose of venom exhibited dramatic symptoms and often died after being injected with a second dose of venom, regardless of the size of the second dose. Richet initially termed this as aphylaxis, which was the opposite to prophylaxis which they were searching for. He later added an an as he thought that an extra syllable sounded better. Richet was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine in 1930 in recognition of his work on anaphylaxis. It is an acute severe life threat clinical syndrome due to a generalized type 1 hypersensitivity reaction on exposure to a foreign substance leading on to mast cell degranulation and release of chemical mediators. As we can note in this table, the definitions initially were non-specific and has undergone several modifications over the years to increase the sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing anaphylaxis. The global incidence of anaphylaxis in adults is about 50 to 110 episodes per 100,000 person years and in children it ranges from 1 to 760 episodes per 100,000 person years. The estimated lifetime prevalence is about 0.5 to 5 percent. There is a wide variation in the incidence and the lifetime prevalence depending on the definition used, study methodology and the geographical area where it has been described. Anaphylaxis occurs when the body perceives of innocuous material as a foreign antigen. The sensitization process initiates with the first exposure to an allergen. The antigen presenting cells capture and present the processed antigen to CD4 T cells inducing their polarization to a type 2 helper cell phenotype. These simulate B cells which afterwards produce and release antigen-specific IgE antibodies that bind to FC epsilon receptor. Future re-exposures to allergen induces the cross-linking of FC receptor-bound allergen and IgE complexes, activating and inducing degranulation of mediators by mast cell and vasophils. These include histamine, platelet-activating factor and tryptases, among others. The mechanism could be immunological, non-immunological or idiopathic. Among immunological reactions, it can be IgE dependent or IgE independent. Food, venom, drugs, latex and aeroallergens are commonly implicated in IgE dependent immunological mechanisms. NSAIDs, dextran, transfusions, monoclonal antibodies and radio contrast media can have IgE independent mechanisms which could be complement mediated or IgG mediated. Certain triggers like exercise, cold, sunlight, ethanol and medications as opioid can cause direct mast cell activation. In up to 40% of cases, the mechanism still remains unknown. They do not have a clear cut history and screen tests may be negative. In such cases, previously unknown trigger or an underlying mast cell disorder needs to be ruled out. In many cases, detecting kit mutation in peripheral blood or in bone marrow may be necessary in order to diagnose systemic mastocytosis. The common agents which trigger an anaphylaxis include food, venom and medications. Food anaphylaxis is very common especially in pediatric age group. Eight foods account for almost 90% of all food allergy reactions. They include eggs, crustaceans, gluten, fish, milk, peanut, soya, and tree nuts. Other common reasons for anaphylaxis include venom, venoms from snake, scorpion, including the ASV which is used to treat these envenomations can trigger anaphylaxis. Other common agents include honeybee, wasp, yellow jacket, fire ants, and hornet. Medications are another common group which can trigger anaphylaxis. 
they may be enteral antibiotics NSAIDs or parenteral administration of antibiotics especially beta lactams paralytic agents and sedatives contrast media vaccines and other blood products latex is another common agent that has been implicated in anaphylaxis food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis is a distinct entity reported in USA Japan and Thailand it is commonly noted among females in their late teens and mid 30s it essentially needs two triggers which is an exercise 2 to 4 hours after ingestion of offending food other than these triggers certain cofactors and concomitant diseases also play a role in aggravating the disease condition the cofactors commonly implicated include exercise infection emotional stress and premenstrual status concomitant diseases as eczema allergic rhinitis asthma cardiovascular diseases and psychiatric illness may aggravate the disease process the diagnosis of anaphylaxis is clinical no lab parameters are required for diagnosing anaphylaxis however serum histamine and serum tryptase are used in few settings in anaphylaxis serum histamine has a caveat that it returns to baseline within an hour of exposure serum tryptase stays in the circulation for at least 6 to 10 hours it is not always elevated in food anaphylaxis however it is useful in differentiating pseudo anaphylaxis from anaphylaxis majority of the centers do not have easy availability to these tests and they are quite expensive to be done anaphylaxis causes a multi system involvement mucocutaneous involvement are the commonest accounting for about 85 to 90% of clinical presentation the common features include urticaria, flushing, pruritus, and angioedema. One need to assess the swelling of lips, tongue, and oral pharynx for angioedema. Ask the patient to speak his or her name in order to assess periglottic or glottic edema. Examine the skin for urticaria or angioedema. It is important to remember that 10 to 20 percent of patients do not have any skin finding. Respiratory involvement is the second common involvement in anaphylaxis. Patients can have dyspnea, wheeze, strider, and late cases may present in acute respiratory failure. Cardiovascular involvement is characterized by acute hypotension, dizziness, syncope, palpitations, chest pain, and tachycardia. Gastrointestinal symptoms are relatively uncommon other than food anaphylaxis and may present with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and crampy abdominal pain. Neurological symptoms are relatively uncommon in anaphylaxis but may present with headache and seizures. Anaphylaxis is highly likely when any of the following three criteria is fulfilled. Sudden onset of an illness within minutes to several hours with involvement of skin, mucosal tissue or both such as generalized hives, itching, flushing or swollen lips tongue and uvula with sudden onset of respiratory symptom which include shortness of breath, wheeze, cough, strider or hypoxemia or if there is sudden reduced BP or symptoms of end organ dysfunction such as hypotonia or sudden collapse. The second criteria is two or more of the following that occur suddenly after exposure to a likely allergen or other trigger for that patient within minutes to several hours, which may include sudden skin or mucosal symptoms, sudden respiratory symptoms, sudden hypotension or symptoms of end organ dysfunction, or sudden gastrointestinal symptoms which include crampy abdominal pain and vomiting. The third criteria is reduction in blood pressure after exposure to a known allergen for that patient. In infant, low systolic blood pressure is defined as an eighth specific hypotension or greater than 30% decrease in systolic blood pressure. In adults, hypotension can be a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 mm of mercury or greater than 30% decrease from the person's baseline. It is important to note that anaphylaxis is often an underdiagnosis. In a study, over 80% of around 7,000 responders correctly identified anaphylaxis when given a scenario of a patient with cutaneous involvement. However, 
Only 55% recognize anaphylaxis in a case without cutaneous involvement. Importantly, diagnostic confusion has been reported in children hospitalized for life-threatening asthma, some of whom met the diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis. So it is important to keep our eyes open for this condition. The common conditions that may make anaphylaxis include acute asthma, syncopal attack, anxiety or panic attack, aspiration of a foreign body, cardiovascular conditions like acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, neurological events like seizure, cerebral vascular accident or autonomic epilepsy. So the non-allergic angioedema such as hereditary angioedema, ACE inhibitors associated angioedema and Redman syndrome that occurs commonly following vancomycin infusion can be confused for anaphylaxis. Vasovagal attack or vasovagal syncope is one of the common DDs for anaphylaxis. There are key differentiating features between anaphylaxis and vasovagal attack. Anaphylaxis occurs in minutes whereas, whereas vasovagal attack occurs in seconds. A common trigger like medication, venom or food allergen may be identifiable in anaphylaxis. Pregnancy, dehydration, extreme fear, stress are common precipitants for a vasovagal attack. The skin remains flushed in anaphylaxis whereas it is pale and cold in vasovagal attack. Respiratory system examination is usually normal in vasovagal attack but we may have vis or strider in anaphylaxis. The key differentiating feature when both present with hypotension is anaphylaxis present with tachycardia whereas it is usually bradycardia in vasovagal attack. Time is the key while managing patients with anaphylaxis. The average time to respiratory or cardiac arrest due to anaphylaxis ranges from 30 minutes in food allergy to 5 minutes in medication allergy. Hence, it is important to recognize this in a timely fashion and initiate the management promptly. Once you suspect anaphylaxis, immediately call for help. Assess airway, breathing and circulation. Identify and remove the trigger if possible. For example, if the ongoing blood transfusion, stop the transfusion. First dose of epinephrine has to be administered as soon as possible. Start nasal oxygen and secure an IV line for fluid resuscitation if necessary. It is important to keep the patient in a comfortable position. Keep them supine as they are prone to hypotension. Allow them in sitting or leaning forward position if there is any upper airway swelling or nausea or vomiting. Pregnant patients may be preferably placed on left lateral position. Any patient with signs of airway obstruction, hypoxia, hypotension or those who need more than one dose of epinephrine with or history of protracted anaphylaxis, if they have comorbidities as asthma, arrhythmia or systemic mastocytosis, or if they live in remote area or present late in the evening, they need to be hospitalized for further observation and therapy if needed. The key drug in treating anaphylaxis is epinephrine. It is administered as soon as anaphylaxis is recognized. Remember, epi first and epi fast. There is no absolute contraindication to epinephrine in the setting of anaphylaxis. The dose of epinephrine for infants under 10 kg is 0.01 mg per kg. For children 1 to 5 years is 0.15 mg. For those between 6 and 12 years it is 0.3 mg. For teenagers and adult the dose is 0.5 mg. The dose of epinephrine can be repeated at 5 to 10 minutes interval as needed. Epinephrine is given on the anterolateral aspect of thigh in the vastus lateralis muscle region. This region is preferred than deltoid because absorption is about 7 times more than the deltoid region. Intramuscular injection is recommended. It is preferred over subcutaneous injection as there is rapid increase in plasma and tissue concentration of epinephrine on animal and human studies. Intravenous bolus dose is not preferred as IM dose is more safer with lower risk of cardiovascular complications such as severe hypertension and ventricular arrhythmias. Note that epinephrine dilution for IM injection contains 1 mg per ml. To prevent medication errors, 
The ratio expressions were removed in the United States in 2016 and only the amount per ml was listed. The ratio labeling still remains in practice in some countries. Auto injectors like EpiPen and Adrenoclick can also be used during acute crisis. However, the availability is limited only to 32% of all the countries and most of them are high income countries. EpiPen comes in two formulations of 0.3 mg and as EpiPen Junior 0.15 mg labeled as yellow and green respectively for ease of identification. Most auto injectors also have a written instruction label on them and is quite easy to use under emergency circumstances. In majority of the countries, EpiPen is still not available. In such cases, home prepared IM epinephrine can be given. The desired concentration of drug can be prepared and stored in tuberculin syringes or insulin pens. It can be kept for 3 months at room temperature and we can ensure protection of light by keeping it in spectacle cases. Expiry date should be written for future, respect, for future reference and it is important to follow up these at every visit. The common second line agents which are used in anaphylaxis include antihistamines, beta 2 agonist, glucocorticoids. However, none of them have been shown to have any mortality benefit. Antihistamines primarily relieve cutaneous symptoms such as urticaria and pruritus. They do not relieve upper or lower airway obstruction, hypotension or shock. They should only be administered for anaphylaxis after epinephrine has been given for symptom control. Bronchodilators similarly do not prevent or relieve mucosal edema in upper airway obstruction. They are used as adjunct for bronchospasm, not responsive to epinephrine. Glucocorticoids are another common group of agents which are given during anaphylaxis. However, the onset of action takes several hours. One ratio for giving them is that theoretically it can prevent the risk of biphasic or protracted reactions. However, there is little evidence for this benefit. It is preferable to use glucocorticoids in setting of severe symptoms requiring hospitalization or for those with known asthma or significant bronchospasm that persists. The drugs which are commonly used include methylprednisolone at dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg per day for 1 to 2 days. In cases where respiratory distress persists, one may initiate high flow nasal cannula and plan for a difficult intubation. In case of strider, the first dose of nebulized epinephrine may be given. If VS is present, one dose of salbutamol may be given. In case of hypotension, poor perfusion, establish a good IV or IO axis and first bolus of normal saline is begun. In case of refractory anaphylaxis, IV norepinephrine infusion can be started when there is persistent hypotension or IV glucagon bolus may be considered when the patient is having persistent anaphylaxis symptoms or when he is on beta blockers. Further organ support need to be continued as per ICU protocols. Expected course in anaphylaxis may be uniphasic, biphasic or protracted. Majority of the patients up to 90% follow a uniphasic reaction where the peak reaction occurs within 30 minutes to 1 hour after onset and resolves within 30 minutes to 1 hour after treatment. Biphasic reactions occur in up to 20% of patients where they can occur anywhere from 1 to 72 hours following an attack. The uniphasic response is followed by an asymptomatic phase following which the symptoms recur. Protracted anaphylaxis is severe anaphylactic reaction that may last between 24 and 36 hours despite aggressive treatment. There are certain risk factors that predict biphasic reaction. They include severe initial presentation, hypotension at presentation, recurrent epinephrine dosing requirement or if it is an unknown or drug or venom was the trigger for the anaphylaxis. It is important to closely monitor the vitals and the respiratory symptom of these patients. The vitals need to be monitored closely during the first 30 minutes and then hourly for the next 24 hours and 2 hourly for the next 48 hours. At the time of discharge, it is important to confirm the anaphylaxis trigger, advise them about avoidance and immunomodulation and suggest home management of acute anaphylaxis. A detailed history taking may be needed during the further visits. Confirmatory tests both in vivo and in vitro may be done 
and it is important to consult a specialist in allergy in order to have a good follow up of these patients. To prevent recurrence, avoidance and or allergy immunotherapy and or desensitization may be done. It is important to have a medical identification alert like a bracelet or a valid card which clearly mentions that you are prone to anaphylaxis. One may also register in electronic or paper medical record the suspected triggers and it is important to have a good anaphylaxis education and training before going out of the hospital. Have a written action plan in case of anaphylaxis. Manage other comorbidities as asthma and keep them under control. Keep epinephrine ready, be it auto-injector or home-based preparations. Know when and how to administer epinephrine and immediately call your state or national emergency number. The mortality following anaphylaxis remains low. Delayed use of epinephrine is the most common association for increased mortality. In summary, anaphylaxis is a life-threatening emergency. It is important to recognize and act fast. In children, foods are the most common trigger. Epinephrine is life-saving. There is no absolute contraindication to the use of epinephrine in a setting of anaphylaxis. Correct route and dose of anaphylaxis need to be instructed before discharge. In hospital management, needs to be initiated early and one need to prepare the ICU if complications are anticipated. Beware of the biphasic nature of anaphylaxis in up to 20% of patients. Adequate follow-up care and education of parents are needed to prevent recurrence of anaphylaxis. If you like this video, please follow us at the following platforms for more updates.